Good morning, and welcome to First Baptist Church, Grayton, California. It is uh, Sunday, August the 9th, and this is our uh, online service. Just uh, two songs and a sermon, and then we will post it online for those of you who weren't able to make it. Uh, to fellowship and worship with us today. You can do it online with us. And then um, at 11 o'clock, we will have worship service out in our park parking lot. So you're welcome to come uh, and attend that. Uh, if you can't make it today, next week is fine. Uh, we're doing, you know, physical distancing. And everybody's got on their masks. and Except when we preach or when we sing. You know, the person leading the worship or the person uh, doing the preaching. So our first song is Come Just As You Are. You are welcome to this church. You are welcome into the house of God. You don't have to come fancy. You don't have to cast away all of your sins. You are welcome here just as you are. It's going to be the Holy Spirit that convicts you. Cast off those sins. song I could just play this song on and on and on come just as you are Jesus accepts you just as you are and so God's people the church should accept you and welcome you just as you are as well 
you are free to come and worship with us no matter how you are. You don't have to leave any baggage that you have outside. If we all had to leave baggage outside, the, the, the churches would be empty. Count your blessings. Definitely important that we count our blessings, that we're thankful. Imagine if you woke up tomorrow morning and the only thing that you had was everything that you were thankful for, the only blessings that you counted the day before. Imagine that. Always be thankful for everything that you have. And Corey mentioned how she couldn't understand why her sister was so thankful that they were uh, assigned to a certain barracks at the uh, concentration camp during you know, World War II with the Nazis and the Jews. And, and she finally realized, or her sister told her, the reason why she was thankful that they were in the particular barracks was that that barrack was infested with fleas. And so even though the people who were in the barracks had to deal with it, none of the guards wanted to go in to the barracks because they didn't want to get flea bites, et cetera, et cetera. And so the people that were in there were able to read the Bible, read scripture, uh, praise and worship God. So see, there's a blessing in just about everything. If you can see it, I ask that God will help you to see those blessings that we don't always see. I'm sure that if we gave that some thought, we would come up with a lot. Feel free to um, contact us with those blessings that you might would like to share. Uh, so the pastor's uh, sermon today 
is out of the Gospel of Luke, and he's going to be in chapter 4, and I believe the title is The Power of Jesus. Pastor. Drop my pick. <laughs> All right, let me move this over here for you. Huh? I haven't picked that yet. I know, because I picked it up and it fell apart. <laughs> Well, maybe that's the way pastors fix things. <laughs> no. Okay. Low, prior, low priority. Yeah, well, I haven't been here all week. <laughs> okay. Well, I guess that doesn't look real good there. It's okay. It's okay? Yeah. I don't I hear, think anybody cares. I don't hear anyone complaining. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty easy when there's nobody here. <laughs> oh, okay. I can't breathe. Oh, it's better. Oh, righty. Well, good morning. Yeah, I hope you have a uh, blessed week, blessed day. I hope you pray to God that you all stay healthy this next week. Uh, we'll have the actual service as a congregation and corporate uh, worship in a few minutes in the parking lot because we can't do it in here. It's a smart virus, you know, knows the difference. Well, um, many of you may have heard about the love of power. And the power of love. And unless you think carefully to the order of the words, you may not realize there is a significant difference. Um, the thing is, the religious leaders, the religious leaders at the time of Jesus, as a whole, showed us their love of power. They would do anything it would take to maintain their power. They would pervert God's word and its meaning and obedience to it to stay in compliance or or in the, in their concept of their idea of their power that is their power came before scripture became wor before worship of god it came before uh looking at fulfillment of the of the prophecies with jesus's presence now the power of love of jesus wins over it wins over the love of power we see this with the temptations of Satan after the baptism of Jesus. Um, Satan tells Jesus, if you worship him, he would give the whole world to Jesus to rule. That is, he'd have the power. The response Jesus gave was out of scripture, Luke 4, 8. Jesus answered, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. So we don't serve power. We don't love power. We had to show love, the love of power, or rather the power of love, by worshiping God. Now we see this conflict about love in today's verses. We see a conflict of the power of love at odds with the love of power. Have you ever known anybody who shows the love of power? If you don't, watch some of the alphabet news stations. Or maybe read a newspaper and you'll see somebody, I'm sure, that shows the love of power. Have you ever seen somebody show the power of love? Greatest example I can think of without having done any research or anything else just right now, just off the top of my head, is uh, St. Francis of Assisi. Now, many of you and probably most people don't know that he was involved in a crusade. It was a crusade of one. Since he had a... Um, vow of poverty, he stowed away on the ship to go to the Middle East. And he met with the, the Sultan involved in, the, in the, all the conflict going on there by himself. No army, just himself. Actually, himself and God's word. And he actually met in the Sultan's tent. And the Sultan basically said, how would I know which is the, the, the true God, the worship, something to that effect, or, or what is the correct way to worship? And St. Francis said, you got a bed of hot coals over here. I'll tell you what. I'll walk across them in my bare feet. And if your religious leaders here will do the same, we'll know who is, to, who is telling the truth, who is correct, and how to worship and who to worship as God. And we'll know that by the appearance of their feet after they walk on those red hot coals. Well, the uh, Sultan's worship leaders conferred for a moment conferred with the sultan, and the sultan said, that will not be necessary, but you are free to go. 
You see, St. Francis believed we bring people to faith in Christ through God's word, no other way. Now, they didn't accept Christ, but the power of love of God let him leave with, the, with basically the blessing and protection of the soul. Now, the thing is, what we're going to see in today's uh, scripture, we'll see that we need to believe in the loving power of Jesus and that Jesus has power over demons. So if you open your, your Bibles to Luke chapter 4, verse 31, we'll start there. And we're going to see that the power of Jesus is through his authority when teaching. That is, when Jesus teaches, we see his power and his authority. Verses 31 through 34, chapter 4 of Luke. Then he went down to Capernaum, a town in Galilee, and was teaching them on the Sabbath. They were astonished at his teaching because his message had authority. In the synagogue, there was a man with an unclean spirit, rather, with an unclean demonic spirit, who cried out with a loud voice, Leave us alone. What do you have to do with us, Jesus? Nazarene? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. So even the demons know who Jesus is. We can look at 400 prophecies and not come to faith. The demons know point blank who he is. So Jesus had moved his headquarters from Nazareth to Capernaum. And it is downhill because uh, uh, though Nazareth is south of Capernaum, it is an accurate statement it's downhill. Nazareth is at an elevation of 1,300 feet above sea level and Capernaum at 695 feet below sea level. So Capernaum is adjacent to the Sea of Galilee. Now Jesus had a synagogue where he would teach on the Sabbath. Now Capernaum became a center of him for doing many of his miraculous uh, activities. Luke 4.23 Jesus said to them, Surely you will quote this proverb to me. Physician, heal yourself. Do here in your hometown what we have heard you did in Capernaum. So teaching with authority meant something different than we might think of today. And that is what the word authority means. Teaching today with authority, we kind of think of having permission or having power over your students. So when I've taught a seminary class in San Quentin or uh, some of the uh, seminary classes in the CLD program, I would have authority in that I would have power over the students. I could fail them. I could pass them. I could give them grades in between. But here... Authority has a different meaning. It refers to the manner of teaching. Manner of teaching. In biblical times, teachers would quote other people, usually other rabbis, kind of like mutual admiration club, to establish authority of their teaching. So they'd say, oh, rabbi so-and-so says this, and, uh, and, I, and I say the same thing, so that's your authority. You're quoting somebody else. Jesus did not teach this way. Jesus was his own authority. And this was one of the major issues between Jesus and the religious leaders because Jesus challenged their authority by not quoting them in his teachings. And probably because they were wrong a good deal of the time. He quoted the scriptures. He went to the source. He went to God's word for authority. Now, unlike other verses referring to authority in the other gospels, the authority of Jesus in teaching includes in these verses much more. It includes his authority to heal. He could just say, be healed and you're done. Why wouldn't you like that today with your medical plan? And the authority to cast out demons. And remember, Luke, in this gospel, is writing to the Gentiles, our non-Jewish audience. Luke's audience might not be too familiar with or even have much interest in Jewish customs, so he frequently does not explain them. Now, in this synagogue, there was a demon-possessed man. And demon-possessed means the, the person who was demonized is under the control of the demon. All cases of demonization that involve Jesus, we see that the demon was indwelling and control the bodies and sometimes the speech of the victim. Demons always immediately 
recognize Jesus. They knew who he was. Mark 124, we see an example of this. What do you have to do with us, Jesus, Nazarene? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. See, Mark shows the same situation. Jesus was here to destroy the work of Satan. That's what he was here for. Hence, the demons are uh, somewhat concerned. 1 John 3, 8. The one who commits sin is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God was revealed for this purpose, to destroy the devil's works. So demons were fearful of Jesus. This demon recognized Jesus as the Holy One of God. Now, the phrase Holy One of God, is a synonym for the phrase Son of God and Lord and Christ. They all basically are saying the same thing, just differently. James 2.19, you believe that God is one, you do well. The demons also believe, and they shudder. The demon in today's verses recognized that today had come. They were afraid of Jesus. Luke 4, 21. They began by saying to him, Today as you listen, the scripture has been fulfilled. That's Jesus talking to his audience. See, what is today? God's kingdom. God's kingdom has come. The demons are now being driven out. They know the abyss was waiting for them. In a different possession incident in Luke 8, verses 31 and 34, with uh, Jesus in a conversation with a demon-possessed person, Jesus says, What is your name? Jesus had asked him. Legion, he said, because many demons had entered him, and they begged him not to banish them to the abyss. They know what awaits them. Now, you show the authority and power of Jesus when you use his teachings to change the lives of others. Uh, an example is, that's quite current is at the Redwood Gospel Mission in Santa Rosa, which this church financially supports. So we're a small church, so it's a small support. I, I teach a recovery class from drug and alcohol addiction. Most of the people in my class, when they advance to be in my class, have only been sober or clean from drugs for about 30 days. So they're still not all there yet. My primary tool is the 12 Steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, which comes directly out of the Bible. A lot of, a lot of Christians, particularly uh, ministers, do not know that. The 12 Steps of Alcoholics uh, come directly out of roughly 144 verses in the Bible. And many of the sayings in, in, in the 12-step program come straight out of the Bible. So it works very well because I have a Bible with me and we actually work with the steps and their biblical meanings. So I do a, a great deal of scripture with them. I use a lot of scripture. And with scripture, most of the teachings of Jesus are, are what these are the scriptures that we're using. I have seen their lives change. I've seen them years later in stores around here working because they have now turned their, li their life over the care of, of Christ. And they're working a program of recovery through the scriptures. So the power of Jesus is shown in the positive changes in the lives of the men in recovery that I teach. Now, as we move on, we look at verse 435. We know that Jesus has power over demons. But Jesus rebuked him and said, Be quiet and come out of him. After throwing him down before them, the demon came out of him without hurting him at all. So what we see is the demon obeyed the command of Jesus. By obeying the command of Jesus, he shows the authority of Jesus. Now, the scripture informs us Jesus ordered this demon to be quiet. See, Jesus does not want satanic forces testifying on his behalf. If they did, they, others may think he's in league with the devil. Actually, he gets accused of that later on anyway by the religious leaders. Also, being publicly touted as the Christ, this would carry political misconceptions which would distract from his ministry. His ministry is to bring people to God. See, many of the people were expecting a Messiah to come to free them, you know, kind of like King David, a warrior Messiah, to, to free them from the rule of the Romans. But the Messiah is actually a spiritual Messiah. Free them from the power of Satan. Totally different. So a, having a um, political misconception would distract from his ministry. 
In today's verses, he performed what looked like a simple exorcism. But in reality, Jesus did not perform exorcisms. Exorcisms involve the authority of another or recited incantation. He doesn't do that. He just rebukes a demon and commands them to get out. That's not an exorcism. He's just telling the demon, I have authority over you. Get out now. That's it. He establishes his lordship over the demon. The demon, In this case, the demon left without doing any harm to the person. Now, you should see the power of Jesus when you see or hear of demons leaving people under the word or command of Jesus. Uh, back in 2004, I was on mission in Mexico for a week during, during uh, actually it was the Easter week I was there for, for a week in Mexico, in, in real Mexico, not tourist Mexico, real Mexico. It looks totally different than tourist Mexico. It's like a whole different country. Uh, unpaved roads, it takes two hours to go 10 miles because of all the potholes and just all kinds of stuff. But a group of us missionaries were showing a Spanish version of the Jesus film, which is in many languages shown used worldwide. About 200 people came to watch the movie on our outdoor wide screen. Afterwards, about 50 of the viewers accepted Christ as our Lord and Savior. But then there was a large commotion to, uh, to the side of the stage before everybody left. They were still gathered around. What was happening to us, there was a woman there repeatedly cursing Christ. She had a strange look in her eyes. And she was just waving her eyes in almost an unusual, not only an unusual, but unnatural manner, just really out of control. Many of the locals stepped back out of fear of her. But a group of the missionaries I was with started to approach her praying in the name of Jesus for the demon to leave her. They formed a circle around her, which they tightened as they got closer to, to her and continued to pray in the name of Jesus. And while they're still praying, she shuddered. She fell to the ground. It was almost like she had a seizure. And after a few moments, she slowly got up, fully recovered, remembering apparently what had happened and instantly accepted Christ as her Lord and Savior. The event and its result is scriptural. Mark 16, 17. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will drive out demons. Most locals who witnessed this immediately came to faith. No hesitation. They were like lining up, coming, say, let's come to faith right now. The power of Jesus was shown by the demon leaving this woman through his name. Now, as we move on, we'll look at the final verses, 36 and 37. And here we see the people were even amazed at the power of Jesus. So the people are amazed. Amazement came over them all, and they kept saying to one another, What is this message? For he commands the unclean spirits with authority and power, and they come out. And the news of him began to go out to every place in the vicinity. So the witnesses were astonished at what they had witnessed. The people were amazed at the words that came from Jesus and what had happened. He showed he had authority and power over even spirits. Elsewhere, we'll see in scripture where he has power over nature, calming sto uh, storms, walking on water. The words in the Greek language indicated this was not just one incident of what perceived as an incident of exorcism, perceived as an incident, but that impressed everyone. The Greek words indicate that Jesus was performing acts commanding demons out of people on a regular basis. We get this out of the wording in the Greek language. So Jesus is becoming a public and popular figure here. Luke 5.15. But the news about him spread even more, and large crowds would, would come together to hear him and, had to, and to be healed of their sicknesses. So you show the power of Jesus when you witness the gospel. Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 through 18. In these verses, the Apostle Paul states he's in chains or prison due to the ministry for Christ. But this resulted in the whole palace guard and others in hearing the gospel from him. And I want to stop and think. 
uh, the Praetorian Guard there in Rome, for fear of them being used to overthrow the government, the people in the soldiers in the Roman Guard there would be rotated out to other legions throughout the Roman Empire after a period of time, so they wouldn't get too cozy with politicians or anyone else. So what happens is, as this whole palace guard comes to faith in Jesus, they're going to be rotated out, and they will continue to preach the gospel in the legions they go to. Now, Paul states that, he, that uh, some, some people will preach the gospel out of love, which hopefully is how most of us will do it, how you will preach the gospel to others. But there are others who preach the gospel, gospel as selfless ambition who are not sincere. Do you know anyone who does that? Maybe you read about them. Maybe pastors who have Lear jets and houses in the Riviera and fly all over the world with these multi hundred thousand or ten thousand or more congregations. Some are sincere, some have turned it into a business. What Paul says in the scripture here in Philippians, it's not important what the motive is. That's not important for the motive to preach the gospel. What is important is the gospel is preached. We are in the soul-saving business preaching the gospel. We save souls for eternity. So we see the power of Jesus through his authority when teaching. We know that Jesus has power over demons. And when people see this power, they're amazed at what, what Jesus is able to accomplish. My challenge for you this week is, is to tell at least one person about Jesus. And if you're somebody who's watching, who's not accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, do so right now. You only have while you're alive here on this planet to accept Christ, to be saved eternally. There's no second chance afterwards. This is it. This, this is not a dress rehearsal. It's the real thing. Let me close with uh, Luke, the verse I usually close with. And maybe if I wasn't uh, 68 and on medicine as a result of cancer, that inhibits the memory. I have to memorize this after uh, 13 years. <laughs> but it's Jude 24 and 25, doxology. It's Jude is the, uh, uh, you might call him half-brother or step-brother of Jesus, who came to faith after the resurrection. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. May God bless you. Have, have a wonderful week. Stay healthy. Tell somebody about Jesus. Participate in saving lives eternally. God bless you. Have a blessed day.